women have had impulses toward freedom since time began. And many of those impulses get lost to the historical record. But I think we, we, we need to realize that we are irrepressible in the long run. Hello, welcome back to Cambridge Forum, coming to you live via Zoom. I'm Mary Stack, the Executive Director, and today we're turning our attentions to a very interesting period of history, the French Revolution. But we're going to be looking at it from a new, vital, but quite refreshing perspective. The decade we're concentrating on is 1794 to 1804, which came on the heels of the revolution in 1789, and after the reign of terror ended. Anne Igonet is professor of art history at Barnard College, Columbia University, and she has ended up teaching a very popular course about clothing. She became captivated by all the unanswered questions surrounding this dramatic period where styles occurred very rapidly during this revolutionary period. After years of painstaking research, Igone was able to put together a detailed book about three remarkable women who crossed paths in Paris at this time and who upended women's fashion and behavior. In the process, the three became lifelong friends during one of history's most tumultuous periods and their cumulative impact upon women's clothing and subsequent thinking is hard to underestimate. So the three women were Josephine Bonaparte, future Empress of France, Theresia Tallien, reputedly the most beautiful woman in France at the time, and Juliette Recamier, who was a muse of the intellectuals. All three of them had undergone dramatic and radical upheavals during the re revolution, and the avant-garde styles that they pioneered freed up women physically, socially, and politically. But this progressive movement was very short-lived. It only lasted a decade before it was reversed. And it would be another 200 years before women could dress so freely again. So welcome, Anne. Congratulations Thanks. on this eminently readable book, Liberty, Equality, Fashion. I think today's the launch. I couldn't put this down. Oh, it's wonderful to be here. Thanks so much for inviting me. So let's start at the beginning. We really need to understand how constricting, uncomfortable, heavy and expensive women's clothing was pre-1789. You say that some skirts were so ridiculous that they couldn't fit through the doors of Versailles. Can you paint us a quick picture of what dressing was like for women in pre-revolutionary France and why they were dying to bust out of their stays and breathe. Well, that brings up the long forgotten sumptuary laws that governed French society, like all European monarchs, uh, monarchies. These sumptuary laws dictated who was allowed to wear what. And basically, the higher up the social hierarchy you were, the more expensive the materials you are allowed to wear. So at the very top of the fashion sumptuary hierarchy, we're talking about extremely expensive, stiff brocades embroidered with gold and silver thread and jewels, heavy furs, enormous coiffures, and all of that over what amounted to top and bottom underwear cages. <laughs> Very stiff, stiff, stiff um, upper corsets. And then below enormous um, like baskets over layers of petticoats. It, it was so expensive that the material for the skirt fabric alone of these top tier outfits 
was so expensive that the kind of women who wove them could never hope to have such a skirt in their lifetimes. They didn't earn enough money in an entire lifetime to pay for even a part of the most fashionable outfits. So there was a weight problem that people wanted to escape. And there was an exorbitant display of control over resources that the aristocracy indulged in that was beginning to cause a real political crisis. So let's look at the three women that you feature in the book. They do have different backgrounds, but share some similarities. So the first probably most recognizable name is Josephine, who was really Rose Bonaparte, who was born in Martinique, 1763, and actually married off to a pretty lowly nobleman at the age of 16. She was already familiar with the Code Noir, which governed the clothing that slaves could wear, and she knew that clothes had consequences. So she's come to Paris to be fitted for a wardrobe, and then she sees how clothing confers authority and a sense of ownership and self, and she doesn't forget this. So tell us a little bit about how Josephine's upbringing impacted her view of the world. Well, this gets us right back to those sumptuary laws, because in Europe, at the bottom of the sumptuary hierarchy were peasants who mostly wore rags. But then in the French colonies in the Caribbean, the Code Noir, which governed the treatment of the enslaved, included from the beginning a provision about clothing. So at the beginning, it was just an obligation of masters to clothe the enslaved in something. But then as the 18th century brought racial ambiguity to the fore because of rape, because of intermarriage, because some of the enslaved were freed, in an attempt to create vestimentary order that was racial, an edict was pronounced in the early 18th century announcing, in addition to the sumptuary laws of Europe, what the mixed race or newly freed of the Caribbean were allowed to wear. And they were forbidden any kind of silk, any elaborate ornaments, they were forbidden lace and ribbons. All sumptuary laws produce pushback. And uh, the women of color on the Caribbean immediately began to push back against this clothing edict in the early 18th century. So much so that in the middle of the 18th century, yet another sumptuary edict was announced to further differentiate between people of color who were free and those who worked, for instance, in white households, who were ranked more highly than those who worked in the fields, creating a, a sumptuary hierarchy among people of color. And that too became a set of rules to react against. The internal competition among women of color in the Caribbean produced an explosion of style creativity, which for the first time in history did not depend on the value of materials, but depended on style because none of the women of color were allowed the valuable materials. So what they did was invent fabulous cotton headdresses and new simple styles of dress that enabled them to assert some kind of relative rank in relation to each other. And with that was a, a tremendous, tremendous revolution in the kinds of clothing that women could wear and be fashionable. And that's exactly the style ecology that Josephine was raised in until she was sent to the mainland where she was obliged to conform 
to what remained of mainland French sumptuary laws. Because as you said, she was married to a very lowly nobleman. And so she became acutely aware, not only of, of where she was in relation to women on the Caribbean, but all of the ranks above her that she was not allowed to dress like. So slavery definitely and directly impacted Josephine's thinking and her knowledge of the gole. Is it the gole dress? The gole, the ship, yeah. Which uh, she liked because it was soft and comfortable. It was made of cotton. Um, and there were 116 different types of cotton available in the world at this time from India. So tell us a little bit about that complicated political structure of the cotton, the world global cotton trading at that time. Well, let's start from the point of view of the French Caribbean colonies. Enslaved labor made growing sugar more profitable than growing cotton, which grew indigenously in the French colonies. Because not only uh, was enslaved labor growing sugar, but meanwhile, the French were developing a colonial relationship to India, as was Great Britain. They were both motivated by cotton. We forget now that the single most traded commodity around the world in the 17th and 18th century was textiles. And precisely because cotton didn't grow naturally outside a band that wrapped around the equator. The French and the British, as they became addicted to wearing cotton, began to put more and more colonial pressure on India. And that put them into conflict with each other. In the middle of the 18th century, the French and the British fought a major war, which ended up with England, Britain, controlling the entire Indian subcontinent, with the exception of a few textile trading posts on the coast, which the French retained. Interesting. All right, let's move to the second player in the trio. Theresia Talian was perhaps the most beautiful woman in France. Like Josephine, she was also married off very early to a nobleman. I think she was 14. And she learned about the power of the medieval guilds in dictating how one was fitted out and, as you said, in what. Uh, later on, she was thrown into jail after her marriage during the Reign of Terror and narrowly escaped the guillotine. So while she's in jail, she learns kind of the value of building alliances and has the indignation of her hair being lopped off and living really in her undergarments in solitary confinement. Um, so she was a, a rule breaker from the start, it seems. Um, and she knew that wearing cotton was a pleasant form of economic sedition. And it also had an equalizing effect. She could start to see the influence of cotton being worn by all the social classes. So uh, why was she such a risk taker? And then how did she cross paths with Josephine? She had uh, tremendous confidence in herself, it seems, from birth, but it must have helped that even when she was a very small girl, every single person who met her said that she was the most beautiful woman they had ever met. They constantly made comparisons to divine goddesses when they described her. So she left her native Spain and came to France simultaneously constrained by this marriage, which her family had negotiated to pry their way into the French aristocracy, very much as Josephine's family had done. And she was not going to suffer those constraints very long because of her inborn character, as well as because of how everyone around her was treating her. Well, there was a huge setback when Robespierre, the head of the Committee of Public Safety during the Terror, basically 
threw her into jail and into solitary confinement because he was so sexually menaced by her her power and her aura that he just wanted to annihilate her and her pride. But instead, she maneuvered through secret messages that she smuggled out of the jail to motivate the overthrow of Robespierre and the entire Committee of Public Safety. She emerged from prison the darling of France because word went around that she had been so instrumental in ending the terror, which was great and it gave her social opportunities, but materially she had lost everything she had no husband, no money, no rank. And she re-met Josephine Bonaparte, who she had known casually before the terror. And the two women realized they were in the same dire straits. And for slightly different character reasons, they decided to team up together and stun and amaze the world with a radically, radically new style of dressing. And they they just kept supporting each other. They would show up at the same parties, both wearing these extraordinary gowns that had utterly, utterly jettisoned the entire under armature that had characterized women's clothing for almost 500 years. And the, the Paris was agog. They couldn't believe what these, these two women were doing. But word began to spread at, at theaters. And, and the two women, together as, as a style partnership, rose to become the first self-made fashion celebrities of Europe. So they clearly had great belief in their own uh, self, uh, the power that they could yield. Um, even though Josephine wasn't that striking, supposedly, but she was very able to maneuver and get herself into places where she could have um, an effect upon the men around her. So I'm thinking of the scene now in Ridley Scott's latest film, which wasn't very good, but I remember the first time Napoleon sees this woman across the room and she's got this dreadful cropped hair and... She does look like she's wearing a kind of shift. And actually, you're saying that was Therese, that not Josephine, that they modeled that look on. They both modeled the dresses, but the bolder of the two was Theresia. And moreover, she was the one whose hair had been ruthlessly chopped off in prison. So it's not like she had a choice when mm. she emerged from prison about what to do. What she boldly did was maintain that prison hair chop as a way of reminding people how much she had suffered under the terror, which was a way of reminding people that she had freed them from the terror. But from the neck down, it was, it was the two friends together. And part of what made their partnership so great is that uh, Theresia was so beautiful that she could have pulled anything off. <laughs> the, the friend who had the idea of what to wear to make that effect was almost certainly Josephine. And it was a combination of prison chic, <laughs> what, what Theresia had, in fact, actually been reduced to in prison, hybridized with what women of color had worn in the Caribbean. Josephine had never forgotten. And when she needed to make a spectacular effect right away, she knew not only that these dresses existed, but that they were so much less expensive to make because of all those strictures that women of color had operated under that this was this was what two women who had no money could actually make for themselves. 
They were the original thrift sisters then. <laughs> so let's go to the third part, uh, the third player who, in fact, they were called the Graces, these three women. Um, Theresia Tallien, the most beautiful woman in France, had been married off. Oh, we've, we've talked about her. Juliette Recamier. Okay. So she comes from a very different and accomplished family. They're bohemian. She has a mother who lives with three men who are her fathers. Her mother runs these progressive salons um, in Paris where everything's discussed, free speech, entrepreneurship, science. She's also taken to the Palais Royal, which at the time was an amazing place. It was like a mall, really, with rest a restaurant. And you said to, sh to shop there was to, quote, flirt with the idea of democracy. So I'm going to ask you what you mean by that. But then her mother decides to, for her own protection, she should marry her to her father. Now, we're not sure if it's her genetic father or not, but Tell us about how that impacted Juliet's life. Well, people did crazy things during the terror because they were terrified. The three father, one mother arrangement was even by 18th century standards, very, very unusual. And it may be that at first, the four people were not sure which of the three men was the biological father of the little girl. And it seemed to be a moot issue because the three fathers were best friends and they stayed best friends. And all four of them raised this child together. One of them, for the sake of propriety, actually married uh, married the mother, but it is possible that that when the marriage took place, th they really were just gambling on who wasn't the biological father of the child and, and who was. Right. One of the three fathers makes much, much more money than the others. He's a brilliant banker. And that's exactly the kind of person who the Committee of Public Safety started going after because it seemed as if the mere fact that they were successful bankers must mean that they were counter-revolutionaries. So Monsieur Recamier resigned himself to death. And meanwhile, to preserve his fortune, he, his two best male friends and Juliet's mother all agreed that because he was sure to die he should marry Juliet, and that way she would inherit his money. But then the terror ended, and he was not dead. <laughs> and he was married to a woman who all three fathers had probably begun to realize in the most amicable way was the biological daughter of the man she was married to. So immediately... The, the four parents swing into PR action and begin to circulate a story that the marriage is not consummated mm -hmm. because they want to protect, they want to protect Recamier and Juliet from accusations of incest because a lot of people know their, their background. At which point Juliet could have resigned herself to a miserable life of enforced virginity. But instead, she looks at what Josephine and Theresia are doing with style. And she realizes that if she does an all white version of their style, that she will simultaneously advertise her virginity and become like the other two women an international style celebrity. So she takes the worst thing about her life and she makes it into a tremendous success. And as she does that in this mode of total purity, opposition intellectuals 
who fear the rising authoritarian power of Napoleon, begin to take her all white virginal style as the symbol of their Republican revolutionary politics and a, an ever widening circle of some of the greatest intellectuals of the revolution begin to take Juliette Recamier as their symbol and to one after another really fall in love with her in this chaste, symbolic, revolutionary way. So she was definitely the most intellectual of the three. And she had this kind of neoclassical look, which was respectable. It wasn't see-through. Uh, it was almost divine in a way, like a goddess. So it made it a bit more respectable, correct? Absolutely. She made the style so respectable that it was easy for women throughout Europe to adopt it. And the adoption which is the most telling is the enthusiastic adoption by American women. Americans loved this new style because they said it was the style of democracy. And they said, that's the way in, in which women in the, the new United States of America should dress for symbolic political reasons. So on that theme of democracy, Anne, you said that the Palais Royal Going there was to flirt with the idea of democracy. What did you mean by that? Well, in the beginning, it was a get rich scheme by one of the most exalted nobles in the monarchy of France. It was a royal palace, which got turned into a shopping and entertainment mall. Rapidly, it also became a prostitution mall. And so people of many different classes and dubious sexualities were all to be found at the Palais Royal. And although conservatives decried this heterogeneity of the audience of the Palais Royal, it just gave it that frisson of je ne sais quoi, of political daring that added to its fashionable luster. And the, the Palais Royal crossed the revolution, maintaining that reputation and continued to be one of the style centers of Paris uh, one, once the, the, the new style took hold. So let's think about this period now, which is 1794 onwards, where they first appear in public, Theresia and Josephine, with this shocking new look. So it's partly this Caribbean Gaulle or Gaulle. Um, she's incorporating some of this Bengali muslin, maybe. And then what about this jammer cut, which comes from India, right? So and no petticoats and no stays and the elite educated class of France was raised on the classics, ancient Greece and ancient Rome, and that associated uh, classical knowledge and neoclassicism with the highest levels of European culture, and so great was that conviction of an ancient Greek and Roman origin of European style, that even though the new style that Josephine and Theresia introduced was manifestly made out of a fabric that the ancient Greeks and Romans did not use, their style was made out of Indian cottons, but also the cut of ancient Greek and Roman clothing was so different from the cut of these new dresses. Okay, what they had in common is no under armature. However, ancient Greek and Roman clothing was made out of huge wide rectangles of wool that were loosely draped around the hips. Whereas um, everyone who knew Indian jama, which was both British and 
French colonists. And moreover, uh, there had been a very high profile visit of Indian ambassadors to Paris shortly before the revolution, which was commented on um, in, in all the popular press. So these, these Jama had very tight fitted bodices, often with, um, with a transparent white fabric. They always had long fitted sleeves and they had gathered skirts which uh, came from the waist, but were worn with really wide sashes. So to Europeans, it looked as if these gathered skirts started way up high under the bust. And that's the cut of these new dresses. But you know, I, I didn't realize that. I didn't even realize that the fabric was Indian until I began to see the actual surviving clothes in, in costume collections, because you know, you can't really tell what the fabric is of a, of a dress in a painting. And, and you, you don't really usually know how it's cut. In a way, they kind of threw a lot of styles and fabrics together in this new look. It was, it was a cobbled together look that, that took some aspects from some colonies, other aspects from other colonies. And then the, 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 the final accessory coup de grace was uh, when Napoleon, who was on campaign in Egypt, sent Josephine a package of shawls from Kashmir. A lot of uh, Indian textile trade passed through Egypt at the at the time. And he sent the shawls to her just as a kind of strange curiosity because they were a very different proportion and embroidered in a very different style than European shawls. But Josephine, remember, had this genius for transposing clothing from one orbit into another. So sh she began to, to popularize the wearing of these Kashmiri shawls. And uh, it, Theresia began to wear them also. Juliette Recamier championed them immediately. And they became the most valuable, the signature accessory, not only of this fashion revolution, but of all feminine fashion throughout the whole first half of the century. And you know, part partly through changing just the spelling of Kashmir to from K A S H M I R I to C A C H M I R E, and then of course when when the Scottish town of Paisley began making imitations, Europeans began to call them Paisley shawls, mm. and that's all it took for there to be a colonial secret hidden in plain sight. You know, of course, at some level, everyone knew that this accessory was from Kashmir, which was also a, a British colony. But like, people just saw what they wanted to see. Mm. You said this was the fastest change of clothes in history, this particular period. How much did it impact all the way down? I'm say you're saying it went as far as the United States. I think the president's wife at one point uh, ended up wearing something that she'd seen in Paris. I mean, was this because of magazines? I mean, how big was the social media of the time? Or was it word of mouth or visits? No, you're absolutely right. There was an 18th century, early 19th century version of Instagram and TikTok, and that was the theater. It was not the actresses on stage who were the most important spectacle. It was the women in the audience. Notably, and we have records of this, Teresa Talia and Josephine Bonaparte, word would spread through the entire theater audience. And then uh, people would write letters, reporters would write letters, um, long letters back to their magazines uh, they were essentially style reporting that uh, was epistolary in form, but but was for periodicals. And then in 1797, two enterprising young men with very little editorial experience, but imagination, launched a magazine called the Journal des Dames et des Mudes, the, 
Journal of Women and Fashion. And they uh, caught the democratic spirit of this style. And from the very first issue, they proclaimed the political and the borderline feminist significance of this style. And they, they tapped into all of the, the feelings that had led in concentrated form to the French Revolution that were swirling around Europe, North America, South America. The, the magazine had subscribers in Constantinople. It, it had subscribers in, in Egypt. And, and so the, the, the news spread further and further through the fashion plates. And actually, one of the most fashionable places in the world was Lima, Peru. Really? <laughs> For reasons that have to do with you know, internal clothing dynamics um, in, in the Andean region, uh, Lima was just a hotbed of style. And they picked up on this new look from Paris right away. Interesting. So this, as you've just said, was a lot more than a style statement. What these women were doing was revolting against confinement, rigidity of movement and thinking. And for the first time, women could move freely and you could actually see their bodies moving. So it kind of affirmed the female form in public. It was so shocking to many people and so marvelous for so many women. It was the first time in centuries when women could move and people could see them move. So of course, some people said that was obscene excess. Other people said it, it was freedom, so much depended on, on your point of view. What's very, very telling um, is that among the intellectuals, who began to gravitate around Juliette Recamier and, and hold her up as a visual symbol of the revolution was the single greatest advocate for women's rights, Germaine de Stahl. Right. Mary Wollstonecraft in Britain had issued a clarion call to women's rights and had immediately adopted the new Parisian style. But alas, she died in childbirth, um, giving, giving life to, to the Mary woman Shelley. who was going to become Mary Shelley, who wrote Frankenstein. So it was, it was left to Germaine de Stahl to carry the torch. And Germaine de Stahl just adored Juliette Recamier and vice versa. So you talked about other peripheral things that happened with this period in terms of style. So we've got the Kashmiri shawls that Napoleon sends from the Egyptian campaign. You've got Josephine's unusual use of the cameo. She practically, I don't know if she invents the tiara, but she starts wearing tiaras. Um, she, the cropped hair becomes a big deal. You can now put turbans on it, like from the Caribbean, or you can put a wig on it. Um, and then finally, the handbag happens because you no longer have to have the hidden pocket in the layers of petticoats. So this is dramatic. Oh, it, it was the beginning of accessories as we know it in the modern era. The handbag was a necessity because these slim Indian cotton dresses just could not have handled the weight of a pocket sewn into the seams. It just would have, the keys that women carried would have ripped the pockets. <laughs> and so, uh, and also it, the bulge would have spoiled the, the columnar line of, of the clothing. So the handbag was invented. And by the end of 1797, it had been declared the single most important accessory that a woman could, could own Okay, and and that that fell back a, a a bit after this fashion revolution ended. But of course, we're living the continuation of that because the the, the handbag is is the most status oriented, the most expensive possible accessory that that women covet now. It's actually gotten much more extreme in the last fifteen or or twenty years. 
And it, it, it was announced way, way, way back when in the 1790s. And, and uh, one of the reasons why we underestimate that is that for formal portraits, then as now, women would pose in an evening gown. Michelle Obama, when she posed for her official portrait that's now hanging um, in the National Portrait Gallery, posed in an evening gown. So we just forgot how important accessories were. Actually, you know, around the core of, of these cotton dresses, it, it spun a, a marvelous array of, of accessories, which the Journal des Dames et des Modes promoted as, as hard as they could. So costs. This is a very important thing that you put in the book. It's uh, you, you explain very well um, about the exchange rate at the time, uh, what the annual lowly worker would earn. And so at the at the beginning, Josephine is quite modest with her wardrobe. And because she prefers cotton, at one time her wardrobe in 1796 is valued at 729 francs. Whereas Marie Antoinette, by contrast, in 1783, pre-revolution, had an annual budget of 120,000 francs just for her wardrobe. That's, so, a, that's a disparity which we can call revolutionary. Right. Um, so we won't go just yet to what happens to poor old Josephine after Napoleon goes through his regressive period. But uh, this opens up close to all classes. Suddenly cotton is the avenue for people to look quite nice and well put together because they're not looking that different from the upper echelons of society now. It was in the most basic physical way, democratic. Uh, the, the plummeting cost of the most fashionable clothes was partly about how these new dresses required at least seven times less fabric than pre-revolutionary gowns, but also because the revolution had abolished the medieval guilds and the construction of these new revolutionary dresses was so simple, it meant that women did not have to go to an official guild master to get a fashionable outfit made. Any woman who knew how to sew, which is basically all women, could make themselves one of these super fashionable dresses. One of my favorite moments in a museum costume collection was when a rack of cheap printed cotton dresses was rolled out. Not very many of those dresses have survived because they got worn a lot. But this, this, this rack of dresses did and it allowed me to imagine a, a flock of working class girls who had made their own super fashionable dresses and, and able to put them on with no help whatsoever. One of the class features of, of pre-revolutionary clothing is that it was so elaborate that an upper class woman had to be pinned into the clothes there were no you know zippers and velcro the way the way we imagine now the 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 gowns were pinned into place with straight pins so you you had to stand very very still while your maid who one hoped was skilled put put all the pins in whereas i learned from these working class dresses that i saw in the museum that they had drawstrings that opened in the front and there were three or four of those drawstrings. So you slipped into the dress, you adjusted the gathers on the three or four strings, you tied four bows, and that was it. And you, you could do it independently. So there's the comfort factor, but also the smell factor, because you can actually wash cotton, and these fine silks and all these elegant bows, they, they relied upon the petticoats being washed, right, underneath. They relied on washing their underwear, but back to the guild situation, those guild masters had skills and they made really elaborately constructed clothing. 
so that the silks weren't so washable and the the fabulously skilled guild construction was not washable either. Whereas these new cotton dresses, it was it was wash and wear. And the the bright prints that um, Indian dyers knew how to create meant that the bright prints lasted wash after wash after wash, which was an alternative to the labor intensive embroidery on, on which patterns had once upon a time depended. And that that meant you're absolutely right that there there was a new kind of physical self confidence that working class women felt because they knew that they were not only stylish they knew they didn't smell terrible. <laughs> so we've got a question here, Anne. Um, how did Napoleon acquire Kashmiri? It says Afghan area shawls in Egypt. Oh, because of military blockades, because of ongoing strife between Britain and France, textile traders who wanted to play it safe would move goods uh, through Egypt. And then they would often repackage them and send them under some more or less pirate smuggling pretext on to a final destination. So there, there, there was a, a huge movement of, of textiles into France through the port of Marseille, which was the mm -hmm. closest major, major port to Egypt. Mm -hmm. So things are going along very well. We've got all this action going on. There's this mixing of classes. There's this very avant-garde style. There's freedom. So now, because Therese in particular is particularly promiscuous, what does she have? 11 children by seven different men or something like that? Uh, 11 children by five fathers. Five fathers. Um, it's a lot. <laughs> so now we're in this post, this regressive period when Napoleon and Josephine are on the outs, okay? And he's still planning, even though they're on the outs, to have this very lavish ceremony to be uh, crowned Emperor of France, and she's going to be Empress of France. Now, this is when he starts to pull in the reins and controls what she wears for that ceremony. And the train alone was 22 meters of heavy velvet. So, so heavy, she couldn't actually move. She couldn't pull the train. Um, and giving the ladies in waiting 10,000 francs each for expenses. So now we're back up with the grandiosity, almost of back to the French monarchy again. So now we've gone full circle um, in an obscene way. It was How a power, feel about this. Oh, it was it was a shift in the power dynamic between Josephine and Napoleon. So when they first met, she was the superstar and the incredibly sexy one, and he was just this scrawny, strange provincial officer. Then, of course, he started to become Napoleon, and meanwhile, she was getting older, and uh, she also was getting used to the power and money that Napoleon began to provide for her. And so the, the dynamic shifted and he uh, caused her to abandon all her lovers. And on the occasion of their coronation, he announced that all the clothing would be designed by his designer. She would not be able to come up with her own outfit. And as you said, it, it was a weighty burden that he placed on her, gorgeous though it was. It, it was a, a, a way of, of reburdening her. Controlling. With, with, and controlling and controlling her. And, and, and also on, on the occasion of the coronation, he broke up the friendship between mm. her 
and Theresia, uh, he told Josephine he would not allow her to ever see her again. And it was actually one of the only, it was one of the only demands Napoleon made, which Josephine made even a feeble effort to protest against. But she she gave in um, and and with very great regrets that these two tremendous friends never did see each other again. He also tried to break up the friendship now with the other, with Juliette and Germaine. And well, he didn't succeed in that one. No, he didn't succeed. He underestimated their friendship and he estimated underestimated their principles. Uh, they they were members of an opposition that, although militarily powerless, was ideologically still very persuasive. So Napoleon decided that he would uh, he would defeat each of the members of this circle in a different way. Uh, with Juliette Recamier, he bankrupted her husband. With Germaine de Stahl, he drove her into exile. And he thought that by crushing each of his opponents, he would sunder them from each other. But the opposite happened. In exile and in very reduced financial circumstances, they became even closer to each other than they had ever been and remained close until they died. So somehow the dress sense is a metaphor. It, it represents way more than just personal individual style. It's a threat. And also the sexual freedoms that it enabled also uh, are thrown in his face. Uh, he's, he's intimidated by that. I think you've put it perfectly uh, that underneath the, the, the clothing surface, there, there was an intimation of a radically different gender role where women just had control over their own sexualities. And the embodiment of that was Teresa Talian, who couldn't care less whether she was married to the fathers of her children. And then to make people even more annoyed and e hate her even more, she turned out to be an extremely good mother. She loved these, these children. Only nine of them survived past infancy, but okay, nine is still a lot. And, and she, she taught the children who were of politically opposite fathers to love each other. And this just confounded all the stereotypes of submissive femininity that gender difference rested on. So even, even though Teresa did not intend to become a political firebrand, she was just really in it for the for the glamour and for a lot of money. Um, she ended up becoming a powerful, powerful sexual threat, and so Napoleon had to uh, had to wipe her out too. And uh, what 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 he did successfully was to bankrupt the the lover that she was with during the consulate who was the father of four of her children. Um, but she ends up marrying a prince, right? Yes, <laughs> she confounded him yet again. <laughs> Though he had bankrupted her lover, yet she was asked in marriage by a besotted prince, a genuine prince. And so, she ended up becoming a true princess. <laughs> you couldn't make it up. Her and had, magazine and had would more, love this. And had, and had more children with the prince. So, <laughs> you know, so one of one of her children was had a father who was a regicide, and and then she had other children who were heirs to a princedom. <laughs> so, uh, just before we uh, go on to the last section about. The sustainability question, which of course we can't ignore. Um, all of these different women appear in paintings, and it's quite remarkable. We've got Therese posing 
in the picture that's very well known of her holding the cut off locks. This is after she's out of prison. She poses for the, she reenacts the picture. And you've got the wonderful Juliet on the, on the sofa looking like a goddess. Very, very confident, very sexy on the sofa. You've got Napoleon making Josephine kneel for the coronation. And these are all, these paintings are all in the Louvre, right? Amazingly, the nadir and, and the zenith of this fashion revolution hang right next to each other in the Louvre. <laughs> You're Juliette Recamier in, in, at, the, at the height of her social power. And then uh, Josephine Bonaparte, regally splendid, but put in her place by Napoleon. And Teresa with her shorn off locks. And her she little... uh, sadly did not pose for portraits that ended up being considered as great. You know, jo Josephine and, and uh, Juliet both posed for portraits that for completely other reasons are icons in the history of, of art and do hang in places of honor at the Louvre. You know, where, where, whereas Teresa uh, had very glamorous, but not as independently aesthetically marvelous portraits made of her. So she she's the one we have to use our imaginations a little bit more to um to to think about. But okay. we have movie stars who who seem divinely beautiful to us, like they belong to some kind of other stratosphere. And I think to myself, okay, well, like just imagine that you you you, you meet Angelina Jolie or you meet Margot Robbie, uh, and and you you. You're just stunned. I mean, we are stunned as we as we look at them on on the screen, and that's how people that's how people felt about Teresa. Well, all I can say is that it's a great read. This book, it's a great gift, um, and I learned a great deal. Um, also, uh, just you finding the path of research is remarkable. The section about how you actually put this picture together was, it was kind of almost a life mission going from place to place, you know, from the Morgan um, collection to your PhD students finding out certain things and putting the pictures with the text. It's, it's really a treasure trove. So you did some remarkable work. Well, academics live for archive discoveries. And I've been so lucky. Um, many wonderful archival finds have come my way and they inspire me to tell what I hope and believe is their story. Well, I think it's an untold story about the French Revolution. I think it's very relevant, particularly because it was this brief 10 year period that eclipsed and didn't return for two centuries. That's what I found so remarkable. You know, Women have had impulses toward freedom since time began. And many of those impulses get lost to the historical record. But I think we 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 need to realize that we are irrepressible in the long run. <laughs> um, that's a great note to end on. Um, before we go, you do close your book, um, and rightly so, being as it was Earth Day yesterday, acknowledging that some of our assumptions about style are going to have to be abandoned to save the planet. And, of course, the clothing industry is one of the worst offenders. And you yourself are wearing all vintage recycled garments today. All, all vintage. Right, because um, as I've taught a course on clothing, I've I've realized that there was a major clothing reset in the French Revolution, and we need one now, where we just we rethink what old means, what new means, what what sexy means, what style means, what fashion means, and and I you know I I I look at the the young students I teach, and and I think oh they're going to do it. They are going to do it. So um, speaking of which, 
I came across an amazing outfit, and there are many around the country. It's in Washington, Bellingham, Washington, and it's called Rag Finery. They not only show you how to make your own clothes again, to upcycle existing clothes, to recycle buttons and all manner of accessories. And we've put the link there in the chat for everybody to see if you want to go and read the article from the Taiyi. Um, also, if you want to read, there's a couple of great articles about Anne's book. One was in Vogue, one was in Town and Country. Um, so you can certainly read those articles if your appetite's been whetted. And you can also order the book or get it from your library if you can't afford to buy it. It's it's one people are, I already got friends that want to borrow mine. <laughs> so. All right, so Anne, thank you so, so much for sharing your wisdom and your zest for the topic today. Thanks so much for chatting with me. It was wonderful. And um, I just wanted to say that Cambridge Forums made possible by the Lowell Foundation, Herbert and Dorothy Vetter, the Mass Cultural Council, and of course you. So if any of you want to send us along a little donation, go to the website, www.cambridgeforum.org, where you can sign up for the newsletter, which of course is free. Uh, we produce weekly NPR broadcasts of the programme, and a video of today's programme will be uploaded to YouTube shortly, courtesy of our wonderful partners, GBH Forum Network. I'd like to thank you all for joining us today.